Alrighty, folks, so there are certain indicators, leading edge indicators as to a society's decline. Some are statistical and some are moral, and typically they tend to cross streams. There's a story yesterday that caught my attention. It flew across the Twitters, and it was a story about the CEO of OnlyFans. So OnlyFans is essentially a, an amateur porn site. It is where people unclothe for money. It is visual prostitution, in essence. And according to Business Insider, the number of creators, and they're not calling them creators, even though it's just women taking off their clothes on a camera, signed up to OnlyFans, surged by about 40% last year, bringing the total to more than 3 million for the subscription platform that mostly features adult content. CEO Ami Gan told the Web Summit in Rio de Janeiro last week, we've noticed a huge uptick in creators as well as fans joining the platform. We attribute that to OnlyFans is very much a global business. We're in over 100 countries. The company is now setting its sights on Latin America and Australia to further increase its numbers. Gan said, we're looking at growth for the business. Latin America is a huge part of that. Apparently, OnlyFans had revenues of close to $1 billion in 2021. And the owner of OnlyFans, again, Leo Redvinsky, has made more than $500 million from the platform since 2020. And of course, the parent company was taken, he took control of that in 2018. So why is this an important story? Well, as it turns out, a civilization in which women are incentivized to prostitute themselves on camera also tends to be a civilization in decline. So th th there's a biblical idea that women are holier than men. And for all the talk about the Bible being sexist, there is a deep-rooted biblical idea that women are holier than men. So, for example, in the book of Exodus, when it comes to the sin of the golden calf, the idea is that the men participated, but the women did not. And the, the, the notion that women are the guardians of a society's holiness makes some sense. Because, obviously, men, when left to their own devices, are not oriented toward children. They, they don't stick around. There's no biological imperative for a man to stick around to raise his child in the same way that there is a connection between a woman and a child. When you sever connections between women and children. And when you make the highest ideal of any society, the sexual impulse, what you end up with is a society in moral decline in which women are prostituting themselves on camera for pay and treating this as some form of magical empowerment. And men are indulging their baser instincts at, at, it, under these circumstances. And the result is, unsurprisingly, a massive decline in the American birth rate. So there's a chart that jumped out at me yesterday. It's from the University of Maryland and Wesley College. And it, there's a piece over at econofact.org called The Mystery of the Declining U.S. Birth Rate. And this is a chart of birth rates in the United States. And what you see is births per 1,000 women age 15 to 44 in the United States, 1980 to 2020. What you see is essentially there's a, at least a certain level of stability to American birth rates from about 1980 to about 2007. There's some ups, there's some downs. There's a big jump essentially about 1990 which coincides with the end of the Cold War and this sort of economic optimism. And then it declines again during the 90s. It goes back up during the early 2000s. And then in 2007, it just falls off an absolute cliff. Starting in 2007, the births per 1,000 women age 15 to 44 drops from about 68 all the way down to today, just over 55. That is a massive decrease. According to econofact.org, the Great Recession disrupted a stable period in birth rates. For the almost three decades, between 1980 and 2007, the U.S. birth rate hovered between 65 and 70 births per 1,000 women between the ages of 15 and 44. The birth rate followed a predictable pro-cyclical pattern falling during economic downturns, recovering when the economy improves. But something changed around the time of the Great Recession. The birth rate fell precipitously, but it did not recover when the economy improved. Rather, the U.S. birth rate has continued a steady decline. As of 2020, the U.S. birth rate was 55.8 births per 1,000 women. That is down almost 20% from the rate of 69.3 in 2007. EconoFact says the decline in births cannot be readily explained by changing population composition. The sustained decline in U.S. births since 2007 has been driven by declining births among many demographic groups rather than by changes in population composition. Births have fallen among women in their early 20s, late 20s, and teens as well. And there's no obvious policy or economic factor that can explain much of that decline. The onset of the Great Recession played a role in the early stages of the decline. But beyond that, it's difficult to identify any policy or economic factor that can statistically account for the continued decline. Successive generations, women are having fewer children at every single age. So generation on generation, women are having fewer and fewer kids. Shifting priorities, they say, could be the primary driver for the decline in the birth rate since 2007. I'm going to suggest that what has actually happened is that since 2007, there's been a bit of a confound. Everybody is saying it's 2007, 2008, economic recession. But as that study points out, the real problem here is not actually the economy in 2007, 2008, because again, according to pretty much everyone, the economy got better after 2007, 2008. It improved pretty dramatically since Donald Trump took office from 2016 to 2019. 
And then it dropped off a cliff in 2020. And then it's been recovering since then. But you haven't seen the birth rates going up and down to match all that. So something else happened. Something else happened. I'll explain what happened in just one second, because that has a lot of relevance to how you live your life and what you allow your children to see and all the rest of it. First, President Trump recently suggested from Mar-a-Lago that the dollar is now under fire as the global currency. And that is right. I mean, China right now is attempting to replace the dollar with the yuan as, as the global currency. Well, that could theoretically happen sometime in the near future. But here's the reality. Even if it doesn't happen, do you really trust the federal government with their inflationary policies to protect your savings? I don't, which is one reason why I've diversified into gold. I bought gold from Birch Gold in preparation for uncertain economic times. You can own gold too in a tax-sheltered retirement account with the help of Birch Gold. That is correct. Birch Gold will help you convert an existing IRA or 401k, maybe from a previous employer, into an IRA in gold. The best part is you don't pay a penny out of pocket. When currencies fail, gold can be your safe haven. How much more time does the dollar have? I don't know. What I do know is that the federal government is inflating the living hell out of it. Protect your savings with gold the way that I did. Birch Gold has an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and thousands of happy customers. Text Ben to 989898. Get your free info kit on gold today. Again, text Ben to 989898. Talk with my friends over at Birch Gold. Get all of your questions answered and then diversify at least a little bit into precious metals. Great way to protect your savings. Okay, so what exactly has happened in Western society to lead to this decline birth rate? Because what you've seen is that this is mirrored pretty much across the West. It's not unique to the United States. But you can see it very clearly in this chart. So what exactly happened? What happened is that the morality, the prevailing morality of the internet, and the internet has a very libertarian morality, which is to say it's a bunch of atomistic individuals who are forming alliances of convenience and who are able to access pretty much anything at any time. The convenience of the internet skyrocketed in this era, particularly in 2007, particularly in 2007. So what exactly happened in 2007 that coincided with the Great Recession? The release of the iPhone. So Facebook hits in 2004, but you still have to access your computer in order to go on Facebook. So the idea that that Facebook communities were going to take the place of, for example, your church community, not really, because you still have to be on your computer. You have to be tethered to a desk somewhere in order for you to access your friends. Whereas that's not the case when you're living in a community, you're moving in and out of your social situations. You're seeing people at restaurants, you're seeing people at church and all of the rest. In 2005, YouTube launches. And YouTube, of course, is a giant time suck. It's a big time waster. It's a place you can get lots of information, get shows like this one, but it also happens to be a place that atomizes you because you sit in front of a screen all day. But that's nothing new. Again, as long as you're talking about a stationary device that is on your wall or that is on your desk, basically, we're just talking about the threat of TV. I mean, YouTube in 2005 was just really a TV thing because, again, the screen that was on your desk, I mean, your computer was effectively a TV when you were watching YouTube. By the way, ironically, it now has turned into a TV thing again. People are using their TVs to watch YouTube, but the real change here, the real ch- and, and, porn, and Pornhub launches in 2007. And of course, there have been pornography sites that have dominated the internet since the advent of the internet. What really happened in 2007 was the launch of the iPhone. So when the iPhone launched, which was the first truly effective, globally marketed smartphone, right? something where you could access the internet easily and, the, and you could get all the pictures you wanted and all the connections you wanted on your phone at all times, people started to be absorbed by the glowing screen in front of them. And they ditched all of the social connections that reinforced all of the societal rules that made life better. You actually need in-person contacts and you need people who hold you to a particular standard in your local community in order for you to live that particular standard. You know, when, when people ask, why is pornography, for example, immoral? So there are two answers. One is the rational answer. And there, there are a bunch of rational answers as to why pornography is immoral. One reason is because, of course, it teaches you to view women solely as sex objects. Two is it teaches you that women want things that very often women actually don't want. And the reason I'm speaking to men here is because the vast, the vast majority of consumers of pornography are men, contra what the media would, would like you to believe. There are some women who consume porn. It's a much, much lower number than men. Virtually all porn, or at least a huge percentage of it, is consumed by men. So I'm talking here about why pornography is bad, and I'm going to speak to men, because partic- they're the consumers. It's really bad for the women who practice it. It's, it robs them of their soul. It takes the most intimate activity that two people can perform and it turns it into a commodity, which is really, really quite awful. It degrades women by treating them as an assemblage of body parts, which of course is a perception that women have to fight anyway because of man's natural visual biology. And not only that, it degrades man's sexual instinct because instead of taking that sexual instinct and channeling it toward the creative, which is what family creation is about, it's about taking this wild sexual instinct and then channeling it toward one woman, love for that person and production of children. And it takes what can be one of the most destructive and diffuse instincts that human beings have and channels it toward the most creative, most beautiful thing you can do, which is the creation of a family unit. And instead, it dissipates it 
in a in a literally masturbatory series of of actions that destroy your capacity to actually build in the world. That's what pornography does. And now it's become wildly accessible. So why didn't people? Pr- so that's one answer as to why pornography is bad. The other is because all your friends and neighbors think it's bad. Hey, this is the way that most people act in the world. That we, we all, because we're in the political sphere, we tend to come up with rationales for why things are bad or why things are good. And that's useful. That's good. But the reality is, the reason that most of us do what we do is because there are certain social standards that we all know and we all agree to and we all understand and all of our neighbors expect of us. And that's why we do those things. Now, there is a um, my, 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 one of my rabbis over here uh, in, in Florida. He, he gave me uh, Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg. Uh, he, he gave me a, a really good what we call the Dvar Torah, right? This is a, a, a word of, of sort of biblical exposition. He says that the word in Hebrew for taste is the same as the word for reason, right? The word is ta'am. So why is that the same word? Because just like you eat food for the nutrition, but the taste makes it better, you actually do the right thing because the right thing is good for you. And then the reason is like the taste. The, the reason is like the pepper. It's good to have the pepper, but that's actually not what makes the action good. What makes the action good is that you're abiding by a good social standard that is good for you. That's why the, the word for reason and for taste is the same. Great additional elements of why you do the good thing, but not really why you do the good thing. Okay, but... The whole point here is that when you have a societal standard that people don't look at pornography, that you're expected to channel your sexual instinct toward marriage and toward the production and rearing of children, this, this is how communities are formed, right? The, the original unit of society is not, in fact, according to the vast majority of societies across all time and space, the original unit of society is not the individual because the individual in a state of nature dies. The original unit of society is the family and all of society is is oriented toward the family. What the internet does, it makes the individual the locus of society. It is sort of the final human iteration of the enlightenment value of pure individualism. Individualism is great when it is placed up against the the overweening tyranny of, of harsh collectivism, right? Well, what makes the enlightenment good is the idea that we do have individual spirits and that we can be creative with those spirits, but that was all supposed to be channeled toward protecting your family, it right, really was that the family was the unit of society. And then with, within the boundaries of family, you as an individual are supposed to go out and flourish, which is why, by the way, it, it, it works, by the way. Married men earn more than single men because they feel a necessity to go out and protect and defend their families. This is the way society used to be oriented. It was a balance between enlightenment individualism and traditionalist family units. And then that balance has been completely upset by the rise of the internet because that glowing screen makes you, that glowing screen is a narcissistic mirror. You, you're, you think you're looking on the internet, you're not. You're looking at things that please you. It's feeding you the things that please you, that narcissistic mirror. The iPhone in 2007, and listen, I have an iPhone. It's an amazing invention. Steve Jobs is a genius. Also, the the subjugation of all societal bonds in favor of, again, alliances of convenience, tenuous connections that form at a moment's notice, the lack of social structure and stability has been horrible for society. And you can see it in the declining birth rate. And, And that, by the way, coincides with another force. And again, this is n- none of this is a coincidence. We'll get to that other force in just one second. First, let's talk about a simple fact. If you do have a family, if you do have dependents, you need a life insurance plan. It's just a responsible thing to do. I have a lot of life insurance on my life. I've joked before that if my wife and I ever have a falling out, her solution is murder probably rather than divorce because of the amount of life insurance that we have on me. But life insurance is a must for you because the reality is, God forbid, something should happen to you. You are going to need to Make sure that your family is supported. Policy Genius makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from top companies and find your lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies starting at just 25 bucks per month for a million dollars in coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid those unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius' license agents work for you, not the insurance companies. That means they don't have an incentive to recommend one insurer over another so you can trust their guidance. There are no added fees. Your personal information remains private. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net and you deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Head on over to policygenius.com slash Shapiro or click the link in the description. Get your free life insurance quotes. See how much you could save today. That's policygenius.com slash Shapiro to get started. Policygenius.com slash Shapiro. Okay, so as you may have noticed, there are a couple of forces that I'm talking about coming together here. One is the force of absolute atomistic individualism that is made possible and reified by the rise of personal electronic devices like the iPhone. Because it takes YouTube, it takes Pornhub, and it puts these things in your pocket available to you at all times. In fact, a huge amount of pornography is viewed on mobile devices, right? Not just on your your desktop computer or something. Okay, but you can also see the decline in religiosity in the United States falling at precisely the same point. So this is an overlay, as you can see, of those declining birth rates. And this 
is an overlay of church membership among American adults. So you can see that the decline in church membership among American adults is fairly, it, basically it's steady from 1975 all the way up to about the year 2000. The internet boom starts and it starts to decline. In 2007, it seems like it really picks up pace. So you go from about 65% in 2005, 64, 65% in 2005, 60, probably 62, 63% in 2007, all the way down to 47% in 2020. So you have a 15% drop off in religious observance in the United States. That's church membership among U.S. adults. That is church membership, synagogue membership, mosque membership. That's a drop by 15% in the course of about 15 years, just from 2007 to 2020. An acceleration in the rate of religious decline. Religious decline was happening in the United States, but not remotely at the same rates that it was happening in the post-2007 era. Why? Because again, people are mistaking those tenuous connections that they make on their cell phone for the real connections of life. They've been taken out of the realm of the real world and they've been taken into this, like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg has talked about the creation of a metaverse in which we live full-time in the internet, but we're already living half-time in the internet, minimum. If, if you ever walk around in public these days, what you will notice if you go to the mall, what you'll notice is at least half the people at the mall have their head buried in their cell phone. This is why, by the way, everyone needs a Sabbath. I mean, like a Jewish style Sabbath. There's a lot of Bible talk in this episode because, again, I think the only actual solution to what we're talking about here is biblical living. You actually do need a 25 hour period every week in which you are forbidden to use your cell phone, your computer or any other connected device. You need to connect with the people around you on a physical level. This is why blue laws used to exist in the United States, and it was a good thing. The idea that there was a day reserve for going to church and interacting with your community was actually an act of good. The, the, the orientation of society around the individual's subjective needs has led to moral decline, and it's led to the most predictable results imaginable, which is the end point of all of this. Right? The end point of all of this is, again, the, the victory of subjective individualism. You can see in pretty much everything, people living their lives to please that screen. And everybody else, every, uh, the only thing that matters is you. Everybody else be damned, right? Your needs are the things that matter more than anybody else's needs. The rest of society is supposed to adjust to you. And this takes some, the form of some of the most absurd sort of symptoms. One absurd symptom is the symptom that you see of people dressing in incredibly provocative ways, for example, at the gym, and then being like, why are you looking at me? Why are you looking at me? This is a story from the UK Daily Mail, actually, about a woman who, uh, who was wearing very, very tight booty shorts at the gym and then suggesting that uh, she's not doing it for attention. And she actually put out a little TikTok video in which she's wearing extremely tight clothing <laughs> at the gym. And she's like, I'm not doing this for attention. I'm doing it for me. Well, first of all, I think you're lying because you're filming this. But second of all, this does fit in large part with the idea that I can do whatever I want for my own subjective self-pleasure. And if you call me on it, or if you suggest there are externalities to my personal behavior in public, then this means that you have violated my sense of self because reality is me and the cell phone mirror that, that I live in. Here's a little bit of this TikTok video. It says, girls that dress like this at the gym just want male attention. And then it's her wearing extremely tight shorts. And then it's... Uh, Gym girls, the men who stare, and it's just a guy like wearing regular clothing and then a woman staring at him. So the idea is that men, how, how could men stare at this? Okay, first of all, I think you're lying. I think that you're doing this for attention. I doubt that you dress this way in the privacy of your own home. But beyond that, let's assume that's true. Let's assume that you believe that you can do whatever you want in public and it's everybody else's job to avert their eyes. Again, this is just symptomatic of the idea. The only thing that matters is what you feel about the world. It also means that all of the social institutions have to be destroyed and remade in the image that you wish to see. Basically, marriage now becomes a Facebook institution to the extent that you can form a group of Facebook friends and call it a marriage. The New York Times has an entire article about that today. Quote, interested in polyamory? Check out these places. Now, what's amazing about this is this is just what we used to call pagan orgies. I mean, this, this notion that you have just a group of people who live together and all married to each other is an absurdity. It's ridiculous, and it doesn't work in the real world at small scale, let alone large scale. But again, the idea is whatever floats your boat, because in, whatever floats your boat, the individual subjective need is what, is what is necessary. According to the New York Times, Jason Knight had heard about Somerville, Massachusetts, while working on a PhD at the University of Alabama in 2020. The small city had recently passed a law granting domestic partnership rights, like the ability to receive employment benefits or make hospital visits to people in polyamorous relationships. Mix Knight, MX period, Knight, who is non-binary and has been non-monogamous since 2014, was impressed. 
In late March, Somerville passed two more laws extending the rights of non-monogamous residents, this time banning discrimination on the basis of family or relationship structure in city employment and policing. Society has no interest whatsoever in the basic family structure anymore. Around the same time these new laws passed, Mix Knight, 38, now a PhD in applied mathematics, moved from Alabama to a house in Somerville with their two partners and a partner of one of those partners. The city's attitude toward non-monogamy was a big factor in the group's decision to move there. Hey, you want to you talk about uh, the sterilization of society in the name of sexual profligacy? This would be it. We simultaneously have the most sexually profligate society in human history and the most sterile society in human, in human history, which is not a great recipe for civilizational victory. Somerville is close to Harvard and Massachusetts Institution of Technology and claims to have more artists per capita than any city besides New York. Often described as hippie or bohemian, the city is staunchly LGBTQIA plus minus divided by sign friendly. There is a significant crossover between those who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and pansexual, and those who practice non-monogamy, according to multiple studies. Oh, wait. Ooh, they said the quiet part out loud. Ooh, sexual profligacy is related to alternative sexual orientations. Oh, no, we're not supposed to say that. We're supposed to pretend that they're all monogamous families. Oh, well, at least they're now saying the quiet part out loud, which is part, again, of the, the generalized decline in morality in our society. And uh, there is no coincidence that birth rates have been simultaneously declining. You need social institutions. You need to know your neighbors. You need to have a family structure. You need to go to church. These are the things that make for a successful society. You need to get your nose out of the phone that tells you you're the only important person on planet Earth. All right, in just one second, we'll get to the fallout from the Durham report, which again, I think may be a revelation of the greatest political scandal in American history. First, are you tired of breathing in polluted air in the comfort of your own home? And would you like to safeguard your family's health and well-being? Well, we have new friends over at EnviroCleanse. EnviroCleanse is an in-home air purifying unit. It's designed to destroy cold and flu viruses, allergy-inflaming toxins, mold, and even more. With EnviroCleanse, they promise far fewer colds, allergies, and better sleep. Those are big promises. They even give you a free air quality monitor to test the difference in your own home. If all the home purifiers are the same, then why did the U.S. Department of Defense select EnviroCleanse to protect and purify the air on board our Navy ships, which is pretty important. EnviroCleanse air purifiers, they have hospital-grade technology, and the purifiers come in size, all sizes, colors, prices to fit every budget. Breathe in some pure air, live a healthier life. Visit ekpure.com. Use code Ben for 10% off your EnviroCleanse home air, air purification unit right now. You'll also get their free air quality monitor plus fast free shipping. That's $150 savings. ekpure.com, promo code Ben. Again, that's ekpure.com, promo code Ben. Make your family's air quality better. It's easy. Go to ekpure.com, promo code Ben, and get $150 savings. All righty. So as we talked about at length yesterday, the John Durham report, the special counsel's report on Operation Crossfire Hurricane and its origins is absolutely damning. It's damning of the Clinton campaign. It's damning of the FBI. It's damning of the Obama administration. Just to give you the brief recap of what is in the report, it now seems that basically the Clinton campaign trafficked via the FBI a bunch of BS allegations about Donald Trump and Trump-Russia collusion. The FBI ingested that with alacrity, and then they started pumping it up to full-scale investigative capacity. And... The White House knew about all of this, and at no point did they say to the FBI, guys, uh, you might be over your skis on this one. At no point did they say it might look a little dirty if you guys are just taking Clinton Apple research and laundering that into a full-scale investigation that's going to last not only for the 2016 campaign, but also well into the Trump years. The story began, just for the recap, in late tw July 2016. That is when Australia provided information to the U.S. Embassy in London surrounding conversations between Australian diplomats and a low-level foreign policy Trump advisor named George Papadopoulos. In those conversations, Papadopoulos had allegedly suggested that the Trump team had received some kind of suggestion from Russia that it could assist in releasing information about Hillary Clinton. That information alone was used as the predicate for launching the full-blown Trump-Russia investigation, despite the fact that FBI officials knew that this was incredibly flimsy and basically there was nothing there. Top FBI officials greenlit that investigation. That included Peter Strzok, of course, who was one of the top officials over there. He was the deputy assistant director of counterintelligence and a devoted Trump hater. He and his lover, Lisa Page, were texting each other about how much they hated Trump throughout. According to John Durham, the investigation was launched, quote, before any dialogue with Australia or the intelligence community prior to any critical analysis of the information itself. So they just jumped in, both feet. So what could have prompted that eagerness? Well, the FBI, as Durham already acknowledges, already had the so-called Steele dossier. That was the compendium of lies and innuendo created by Fusion GPS at the behest of the Clinton campaign. The FBI had also been approached by a second source working with Fusion GPS in July of 2016. So there are a couple of, of different sources, all stemming from Fusion GPS, which is the Clinton campaign, feeding this crap to the FBI. 
The FBI's assistant legal attache in London knew the Papadopoulos information was thin, but told the OIG, that's the Office of Inspector General, that FBI management was, quote, pushing the matter so hard there was no stopping the train, making it his job to, quote, unquote, grease the skids. By the way, at the same exact time, it's not as though they didn't know that the Clinton campaign was pushing this stuff. They did. In July 2016, according to this report, U.S. intel agencies found out about Russian intelligence suggesting that Hillary had approved a campaign plan to gin up allegations of Trump-Russia collusion. In fact, on August 3rd, this is like one week after the investigation was launched, CIA Director John Brennan, quote, met with the president, vice president, and other senior administration officials, including but not limited to the attorney general and the FBI director, and briefed them on the so-called Clinton plan. Nobody decided, hey, guys, maybe we'll put a, let's put a hold on this Trump-Russia stuff until we find out if it's just Clinton-Apple research. Because, by the way, with like three phone calls, they could have found out that it was Clinton-Apple research. So here's what we now know. Top officials at the White House and at the FBI, they were aware that Hillary Clinton had a plan to disseminate information falsely claiming Trump-Russia collusion. They knew that they had really, really, really like thread-thin information on Trump and Russia. And they launched a full-scale investigation anyway. And it ate up not only the election cycle, but pretty much the entirety of Trump's presidency. Okay, so this should be incredibly damning. Because what it means is that Hillary Clinton was in fact colluding with the FBI and with the Obama administration, for which she had worked, in order to essentially twist the election narrative in her own favor. And Obama was okay with it. Biden was present for those conversations. People who were in the Clinton campaign who now are part of the Biden team, were involved in all of this. And the media went right along with it. Not only did they go along with it, they fostered it. Right? The New York Times won Pulitzer Prizes based on their Trump-Russia collusion reporting, which is madness. Okay, so now the reaction has come out. And it's led by Barack Obama, who, of course, was informed on August 3rd of the Clinton plan and was like, I don't, well, you know, it's Hillary's plan. Let's do it. What's the problem? Let's go. Let's do it. Trump can't be president. That guy said I was born in Kenya. Can't do it. So uh, yesterday he did an interview, did did the former president of the United States, and he said he's deeply worried about the divided country, which is always, uh, it is hard to imagine. Uh, Everyone talks about Trump being divisive. Barack Obama was a way more divisive president than Donald Trump. The reason I say that is because no one expected Donald Trump to be unifying. Like if you expected Trump in 2016 to be a unifier, I don't know what you were smoking. You were high on, you were like snorting Parmesan cheese off the carpet like Hunter Biden, if you expected Trump to be a great unifier in 2016. But in 2008, everybody thought Trump, that Obama was going to be a great unifier, and then he turned out to be massively divisive. So the delta between expected unification on Obama and delivered unification was just Pacific Ocean wide. So here is Barack Obama explaining that he, he's very upset about our divided country, says one of the most divisive people in American history. I'm an optimistic man, mm-hmm. but I find myself falling into this space where I have concern about the country that they will inherit right. once I'm gone. Post-presidency, what about this country keeps you up at night? The thing that I'm most worried about is the degree to which we now have a divided conversation, in part because we have a divided media. Oh, so, so what he would like, again, is a propagandistic media that always repeats his talking points. And the Durham report is just a perfect example of this. Again, the media still claim that this, this guy, his only scandal is a tan suit. Never mind the IRS scandal in which his head of IRS was targeting conservative institutions. Never mind the fact that he apparently was personally briefed on the Clinton plan and said nothing while the FBI launched a spurious investigation into Donald Trump. Never mind the fact that Barack Obama presided over foreign policy collapse and was shipping pallets of cash to the Iranians. Now, like None of those things were scandals, according to the media. So, of course, he would love the media to go back to its propagandistic monopoly. He would love it because then, presumably, you could have the kind of media coverage you've seen over this Durham report thing. So the Durham report breaks and the media's take on it is nothing new to see here. Nothing to see here. You're all overestimating how terrible it is. There's really not a problem. CNN's legal expert, for example, Jennifer Rogers, she fully dismisses the Durham report. You see this report and it's 300 pages long. It cost millions of dollars to do, but there is any teeth to this? It doesn't seem like it. There's nothing there, Sarah. I mean, this is really a rehashing of what the DOJ inspector general found four years ago. I mean, there were some problems with the Crossfire Hurricane investigation. They were all documented oh. by the DOJ inspector general. FBI changed policies in dozens of instances to account for those. And that's it. So this is the deep state conspiracy, right? The FBI was out to get him. They wanted to help Hillary Clinton, although apparently didn't do it very well because, of course, she lost. This was the whole thing. 
multiple people at the highest reaches of the FBI were going to go to prison, right? Well, no one went to prison. Two people were charged as a result of Durham's work. They were both acquitted at trial. This was a whole big nothing. They did not prove this deep state conspiracy because it never existed in the first place. All right. You're calling this a nothing burger. That's such a lie. Of course the deep state... Oh my gosh, a nothing burger. It's nothing. It's a big bowl of nothing with some nothing whipped cream on top with some nothing sprinkles. Or alternatively, it's the greatest American scandal involving the, the so-called deep state I've ever seen, certainly of my lifetime, by, by a long margin. I mean, this is way worse than Watergate. Watergate was Richard Nixon deploying a couple of dullards over to the Watergate Hotel in an attempt to bug his political opponent, which, by the way, had actually happened during LBG's campaign against Barry Goldwater. And no, nobody ever talks about that. LBG actually tried to do the exact same thing to Barry Goldwater. No one cares about that. Here you have the weaponization of the most powerful domestic law enforcement institution in the United States at the behest of the Clinton campaign and the Obama administration. And it's nothing because no one wants to jail. Okay, so by the way, I, I've never seen that sort of standard applied to Donald Trump. Donald Trump isn't in jail. Donald Trump hasn't been criminally charged with anything beyond jaywalking by Alvin Bragg in Manhattan. That's a BS case, as everybody knows. But they still call him a criminal. They still say that he's a scandalous person. He was impeached twice. That's how terrible Donald Trump is. So the standards radically change. But again, this is why Barack Obama wants his monopolistic media back, because they will defend anything the Democrats do, anything they do. Joe Scarborough, too. He jumped in. He said, oh, it's a dud. It's a dud, says Joe Scarborough on MSNBC. Uh, the, the report's language is often uh, stark, describing Trump's uh, campaign uh, to Russian outreach as a, quote, grave counterintelligence threat. Let, let me say, say that again. Uh, describing Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort's receptivity to Russian outreach as a, quote, grave counterintelligence threat that made the campaign susceptible to, quote, malign Russian influence. This was Marco Rubio and other members of the Republican Senate committee, the Intel committee, saying this. Uh, and yet the conclusions that are drawn here, again, they really seem to it's just seems to be a complete dud. Once again, Another dud by John Durham. Oh, it's a dud, guys. It's a dud. So it doesn't matter that the FBI knew full well that they were operating on nonsensical information. That was crap. And that they knew full well that Hillary Clinton was literally wandering this information through them. Apparently, that is a big nothing burger. It's a nothing burger with nothing ketchup and nothing pickles. The New York Times is Michael Schmidt tried to do the exact same thing. Again, this is why the left loves their monopolistic media, because they all repeat the same talking points. So at the end of the day, for people watching who are trying to remember everything that got us here over the last, what, seven years or something like that, what is the takeaway? What is the end result of all of this? What do we know about collusion or alleged collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russians? I, I think what, what we know is that the Trump campaign invited this help from the Russians. We know from our own eyes and from watching that Donald Trump asked Russia to help him. He did that very publicly and in doing so brought a lot of these questions on himself. It was Trump's fault for bringing the questions on himself. You see, it wasn't a Clinton dirty trick that was absolutely participated in by the FBI and the Obama administration. The New York Times, by the way, calls this a conspiracy theory now. Quote, the Durham report offered few conclusions. The right drew its own. Conservative, this is Jonathan Weissman, one of the worst reporters of the New York Times. Conservative leaders and right-wing outlets say the special counsel report, which produced no startling revelations, lends credence to their conspiracy theories about the FBI. See, it's a conspiracy theory now. So it was not a conspiracy theory when they were literally claiming that Donald Trump was a cat's paw for Vladimir Putin. That was not a conspiracy theory. That was fact. And if you didn't believe it, they would yell at you on national TV about it. In fact, if you expressed any doubt, people would laugh at you. I remember back in 2018, I was on Bill Maher's show and Bill asked me specifically about the Trump-Russia collusion stuff. I said, I don't see any evidence of this stuff. It seems like nothing to me. The audience laughed at me, like full, full on laughed about it because it was so clear that obviously Trump was a Russian's cat's paw. But don't worry, that was not a conspiracy theory. That was reality. The real conspiracy theory is suggesting that what John Durham says in the report is actually what happened. Truly amazing. We'll get to Donald Trump's reaction to all of this momentarily. First, if you're in a small business, you need to plan ahead. One of the best ways to do that, you use stamps.com to mail and ship. Stamps.com lets you print your own postage and shipping labels right from your home or office. It's ready to go in minutes, so you can get back to running your business sooner. Stamps.com offers rates you can't find anywhere else, like up to 84% off USPS and UPS. Plus, 
They automatically tell you your cheapest and fastest shipping options. For 25 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. Get access to the shipping services you need to run your business right from your computer. No lines, no traffic, no waiting. You can print postage whatever, wherever you do business. They even send you a free scale, so you'll have everything you need to get started. It's super simple. We've been doing it at Daily Wire. Since 2017, we've saved ourselves a ton of time and a ton of money. Set your business up for success by getting started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code Shapiro for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage and free digital scale. No long-term commitments, no contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the homepage, enter promo code Shapiro. Again, Stamps.com, click that mic at the top of the page, enter code Shapiro, start saving time, start saving money. Don't schlep your stuff down to the post office. Let Stamps.com handle it for you. Instead, Stamps.com, click that mic at the top of the page, enter code Shapiro. Also, you can never start thinking about Father's Day gifts too early. A gift of Jeremy's razors is dual purpose. Not only are you helping your dad look his best each day, you're also kicking woke out of his bathroom. There is no other razor that can do that. Shaving isn't just about grooming. It's about embracing masculinity and feeling like a real man. Save 30% off on Jeremy's razors. Select bundles and razor starter sets as part of our Father's Day sale. Go to jeremysrazors.com today. Help dad kick woke out of his bathroom. Let me, let me show you this product. Behold, Jeremy's razors. We shall open it and I shall show you This is what a razor looks like. A razor. That is Jeremy's razor. In fact, it says it directly on the handle. Jeremy's razors. That's how you know that it's a Jeremy's razor. It's a good razor. Also, it means that you're not giving your money to the corporations that think that you should give your daughter like a razor set to shave her face. Go to jeremysrazors.com today. And, you know, great Father's Day gift. Okay, meanwhile, Donald Trump is reacting to the Durham report. And uh, suffice it to say, he is significantly less sanguine about the Durham report than Democrats seem to be. Uh, So here, here was Donald Trump's reaction yesterday. Well, after looking at the report and after seeing, and don't forget, I did a house fire. I fired a lot of people, but the deep yeah. state goes deep. Hey, firing yeah. Comey was not, you know, that was, and I fired him very early. You know, a lot of people said, why did you wait so long? He was fired very, very early. And right. uh, it was a great firing. I'm telling you, uh, yeah. they were looking to do real bad. This was, this was a coup that they were looking at. These are sick people. Okay, meanwhile, the Democrats are responding by essentially saying that nothing happened. Adam Schiff, who is one of the great liars of our time, spent years with a pup tent actually erected directly outside the green room at CNN so that he could run in every five minutes and tell us that we were on the verge of the overthrow of the country thanks to Vladimir Putin's collusion with, with Donald Trump. Well, now he, uh, he is suggesting that nothing happened on MSNBC. It's totally fine, guys. It's everything was fine. Yeah, this is an investigation that started in a flawed manner. It was conducted in a flawed manner, uh, and its conclusion uh, is a a flawed conclusion. So we have four years uh, of wasted effort. uh, And worse than that, we have four years, I think, of uh, undermining the department in a political prosecution. Yes, there was disparate treatment, uh, and Hillary Clinton got the far worse end of it. Hillary Clinton got the far worse end of it? Did, did they launch a false investigation under the auspices of a Donald Trump leak? Like, what, what? that guy, the fact that that person is still a somewhat respected commentator is just beyond me. That, that he's a congressperson who's not, I mean, he should be impeached for what he did, for lying to the American people about what he had access to. It's totally insane. Huh, by, by the way, Joe Biden was privy to all this information when he was vice president. He was literally briefed on August 3rd about the Clinton plan and apparently was fine with it. Hey, Karine Jean-Pierre was asked about all of this and uh, she walked away, of course. What is the White House reaction to Special Counsel Durham's report on how the FBI handled the Trump Russia probe? I would leave it to the Department of Justice to so speak the to. He talks often about how he wants the DOJ and FBI to remain independent and um, you know above the fray. That report seems to reflect the opposite. Is does he agree with uh, Special Counsel Durham that there needs to be wholesale changes at the FBI? Again, that is uh, with the Department of Justice. That's not something that I'm going to speak from the podium. As you just stated in your question, we believe in an independent uh, de- Department of Justice. That's what the president said when he was running, and that's what he, the president has said the last two years. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys. In- yeah, there, there's nothing quite like the uh, independence of the department, and she will catch you up and just leaving a cloud of dust behind her. I will note at this point. Uh, that the Department of Justice uh, apparently has no problem with the IRS now removing its investigative team from Hunter Biden's probe. So this is so everything is going great. I mean, you, you should believe in your law enforcement institutions. According to The New York Post, the IRS on Monday removed the entire investigative team from its long running tax fraud probe of the first son, Hunter Biden, in alleged retaliation against the whistleblower who recently contacted Congress to allege a cover up in the case, according to The New York Post. The purge allegedly was done on the orders of the Justice Department. That's totally independent Justice Department. Yeah, man. They're so independent. 
The whistleblower's attorneys informed congressional leaders in a letter. The lawyers wrote, quote, today, the IRS criminal supervisory special agent we represent was informed that he and his entire investigative team are being removed from the ongoing and sensitive investigation of the high profile controversial subject about which our clients sought to make whistleblower disclosures to Congress. He was informed the changes at the request of the DOJ. So the DOJ is basically in an attempt to prevent information from getting out about what exactly Hunter Biden is being investigated over. The DOJ canned the IRS team that included the whistleblower. Remember, whistleblowers are good if they're Democrats. Whistleblowers are very, very, very bad if they might damage Democrats. Okay, meanwhile, the debt ceiling debate continues. And Joe Biden's main strategy seems to be yelling at the wind. He was out there again yesterday suggesting we just can't default. We can't. You know who might have a say in whether we default or not would be you, sir. Here was Joe Biden attempting to read a teleprompter. America cannot default on its debt. If we were to do that, it would be catastrophic. It would be devastating for America and, quite frankly, the whole world. It would be a recession. We'd find that everything was changed. Our economy Mm. would really crater. It really would have a profound impact on how we live our lives. We'd find ourselves in a position where we no longer were viewed as a leader of the world economically. And we can't let that happen. It's beyond comprehension. No serious person in either party has ever thought this was an option. Uh, well, I mean, you literally voted against the debt ceiling increase when you were in the Senate. Has ever thought it was an option? Uh, I, I noticed that. Also, you know, you could negotiate. That 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 could be a thing. Apparently, Joe Biden is about to negotiate because he has to. And Janet Yellen, again, just yelling at, at people and suggesting that if the debt ceiling is hit, that it's the end of the world is not an actual negotiation strategy. Here is Janet Yellen, the garbage secretary of the Treasury. The fault on our debt would produce an economic and financial catastrophe. Household payments on mortgages, auto loans, and credit cards would rise, and American businesses would see credit markets deteriorate. And on top of that, it's unlikely that the federal government would be able to issue payments to millions of Americans, including our military families and seniors who rely on Social Security. This economic catastrophe is entirely preventable. The solution is simple. Congress must vote to raise or suspend the debt limit, and it should do so without conditions. Without conditions, says Janet Yellen. I mean, sure, we have a $31 trillion national debt, but the answer to that national debt, according to the Biden administration, is to raise the debt ceiling without any sort of reining in of the spending. That's literally what Corinne Jean-Pierre said yesterday. She said, we have to raise the debt ceiling because the national debt is too high, which makes no sense at all. This is like saying... I, Listen, I have to take out a second credit card because I'm spending too much money. I'm spending too much money, so I have to take out a second credit card. Here she is. How is it not a crisis when the country literally owes more than it's worth? You should ask the the speaker this question. This is his job. This is his constitutional duty to move forward and get the debt limit done. That is a question for him. They are the legislative, it is a co-equal branch, as you know, they are the legislative body, and this is what they're supposed to do. That is a question, seriously, that is a question for the Speaker and the MAGA Republicans who are literally holding our economy hostage. I, I have to move on. She has to move on, of course. She, she must, she must. She refused to call the debt crisis a crisis, but the only way to solve a debt crisis is to take out more debt, obviously, obviously. Uh, Now, the good news here is that Joe Biden is likely to cave. According to the Washington Post, Biden and top congressional leaders expressed optimism about urgent negotiations over the debt ceiling after a meeting at the White House on Tuesday, as the administration's liberal allies worried that talks with House Republicans over the budget risk rewarding the GOP's hardline stance. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy sounded confident an agreement could be reached ahead of the June 1st deadline. Now, again, Joe Biden has to do this because if not, he's going to get a recession. He can try to blame the Republicans for that. But the reality is the president gets blamed when there's a recession, period, end of story. And so... The likelihood that Republicans get something out of this is is actually quite good, which is showing a certain durability to Speaker McCarthy that I think a lot of people didn't think he had. There's a lot of talk about how Speaker McCarthy couldn't even get the speakership originally and he had to go through several votes. He's proved that he can actually move some legislation forward, which is a lot more than can be said for Joe Biden's agenda with the Republican Congress thus far. Okay, in just one second, we'll get to Congress blaming not the federal government for its own failings, but blaming the banks for relying on the federal government. We'll get to that momentarily first. You need Black Rifle Coffee because I need Black Rifle Coffee. So my kids wake me up too early every morning. And I'll be honest with you, like until I have the coffee, I'm in a very, very bad mood. Black Rifle Coffee is keeping me alive. Black Rifle Coffee literally fuels the Daily Wire. Our office drinks about 40 pounds of their coffee every single week. 
If you haven't tried Black Rifle Coffee yet, you need to. A great place to start is their Complete the Mission Fuel Sampler, giving you a taste of the entire spectrum of Black Rifle Coffee flavor profiles. Offering four-ounce bags of the following roast, the Silencer Smooth, the AK-47 Espresso, Beyond Black, and Just Black. The only hard part will be picking a favorite amongst these classic roasts. Black Rifle Coffee is a veteran-founded coffee company operated by principled men and women who honor those who protect, defend, and support our country. With every purchase you make, they give back. Stop running out of coffee. Sign up for a Coffee Club subscription. Have Black Rifle Coffee delivered straight to your door on a schedule. Coffee Club subscribers receive their high-quality coffee at lower prices with free shipping. Plus, they get early access to exclusive deals and prices. Go to BlackRifleCoffee.com. Use promo code Shapiro at checkout for 10% off your order. That's BlackRifleCoffee.com. Use promo code Shapiro for 10% off. You can also find Black Rifle Coffee in grocery and convenience stores near you. Black Rifle Coffee is indeed America's coffee. Okay, meanwhile, one of the things that absolutely drives me nuts is that Joe Biden's economic policy has been an absolute disaster area. And then people who relied on Joe Biden are the ones who end up taking it in the teeth. So yesterday, the heads of Silicon Valley Bank did a hearing in front of Senate and Democratic senators called them forward to rip on them. How dare Silicon Valley Bank experience financial hardship? It's so bad. We had to bail you guys out. That's terrible that we bailed you guys out. Okay, the reason Silicon Valley Bank had to be bailed out is because they had faith in Joe Biden. It is that simple. Silicon Valley Bank took a bunch of its depositor holdings, invested it in bonds, government bonds. You know, it's supposed to be a really solid investment, government bonds. You know what the problem was is that they expected that Joe Biden was not then going to have a 40-year inflationary run requiring the Federal Reserve to jack up the interest rates, therefore making their bonds worthless. So their big mistake, Silicon Valley Bank, is that they relied on Joe Biden not to crap the bet on the economy. And then he crapped the bet on the economy. And so the predictable result is that Silicon Valley Bank had a run on its assets. And when the run on its assets happened, they couldn't actually liquidate all of their bond holdings because their bond holdings were effectively worthless. So senators called in Silicon Valley Bank. And instead of calling in like, you know, Jay Powell for his garbage Federal Reserve policy or calling in Janet Yellen for her bad Secretary of the Treasury policy or calling up anybody in the Biden administration. Instead, they called up Silicon Valley Bank to yell at them. So Elizabeth Warren suggested that um, the Silicon Valley Bank was really the problem. Again, she is the person who would be the first to suggest that you should be investing in the government bonds because she actually believes the government should basically take over the banking system entirely. That, that, the, that you should be completely reliant on the government. Silicon Valley Bank's problem is that it relied on the government too much. Her solution is that the government should own the banks. But she's very angry at Silicon Valley Bank. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. So how much of the $20 million that you earned from loading up Signature Bank with risk are you planning to return to the FDIC? I believe that Signature Bank was a what responsibly managed bank, solvent until the end. Yeah, well, I'm and sorry. Your is, opinion on what is not. a responsibly and managed bank is, no. is now laughable. So you're planning to return how much? The answer is none. That's I it? I'm not planning to do so, no. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, how much money is Elizabeth Warren going to give up of her of her family estate, given the fact that she's been a complete useless person for the last 30 years masquerading as a Native American. And I'm not seeing a lot of that. Again, I'm not a big defender of Silicon Valley Bank. My only point here is that if you're going to blame somebody, blame the federal government for completely botching the policy so badly that this bank, which did exactly what, I mean, Elizabeth Warren is a proponent of modern monetary theory. Modern monetary theory suggests that you can spend as much money as humanly possible if you're the government and never have an inflationary spiral, which is precisely what Silicon Valley Bank apparently banked on and then they failed and then she's yelling at them. It's truly amazing. Well, those hearings are absurd in and of themselves. They got even more absurd when John Fetterman tried to ask a question. So again, we now have not one, but two Democratic senators who are not mentally capable of holding the position. I'm not just talking about in political terms. I mean, physically cap incapable on a brain level of holding the position. You have Dianne Feinstein, who is fully senile at this point, but still in the Senate. And John Fetterman, who's brain damaged from a stroke, trying to ask questions at Senate hearings. And it's actually painful to watch. Is, is it staggering? Is it a staggering resp it's a responsibility that, a, that that the head of a bank could literally could literally crash our economy? It's astonishing. That's like if you have, I mean, like, uh, and and they also realize is that 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 now they have it's in a guaranteed a guaranteed way to be saved by no again by no matter no by by, by how you know. So it, it's that's it's, a good question. You know, isn't it appropriate that the, those kinds of the, this kind of control should be more stricter to prevent this kind of thing from going? Or should we just go on and start bailing and sailing whoever bank, regardless of how how uh, uh, their uh, their conduct is? <laughs> and the witness is like, I don't, what? The witness is like, is that a question? Is that is that English? Was there a question mark? 
was there any association between the words you're trying to say and meaning? Like, what, what is that? Oh, man. Only the best. We only send the best to the United States. Senator. Okay, meanwhile, Joe Biden held an event yesterday in honor of Jewish American Heritage Month. And he, along with Doug Emhoff, who is our uh, official Jewish emissary in the White House, we the Jews, uh, Doug Emhoff, who is um, a very, very observant Jew. I'm being extraordinarily sarcastic right now. These, these, are, these are the people who are going to talk about anti-Semitism and the necessity to fight it. So Joe Biden suggested that he has a plan to fight anti-Semitism. Now, mind you, that plan will have nothing to do with chiding Bernie Sanders for actually participating in full anti-Semitism with Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar. Like, it'll have nothing to do with, with Joe Biden actually saying to members of his own congressional party, guys, maybe you shouldn't hold a day declaring Israel's ex existence a disaster. Nakba day. Maybe you shouldn't do that. Joe Biden won't have anything to say about that. But he has words about anti-Semitism, does Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. Under my presidency, we're going to continue to condemn and combat anti-Semitism at every turn. That's why I signed the Bipartisan COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act to help enforce better and help enforce law enforcement better address these hate crimes. Appointed America's first ambassador level special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. General, excuse me, Deborah. Is De Deborah here? Ay, ay, ay. Yeah, meanwhile, Joe Biden has nothing to say about actual anti-Semitism from his own party. This is the same administration that restored hundreds of millions of dollars to the Palestinian Authority, which has been actively fomenting terrorism against Jews culminating in vast waves of terror attacks. Again, he's actually giving, he's spending your taxpayer money on this guy. This is Mahmoud Abbas, who's the leader of the Palestinian Authority. The last election that was held in which Mahmoud Abbas won an election was 2006. So he is currently in the 17th year of a four-year term is Mahmoud Abbas. And we are sending hundreds of millions of dollars to him because of Joe Biden. Well, here he was, and Joe Biden really wants to fight anti-Semitism. Here's Mahmoud Abbas over the weekend, essentially declaring that, the Jewish state should not exist and that it's a colonial outpost and all the rest of this anti-Semitic nonsense. Says Israel has been digging underneath the Al-Aqsa Mosque for 30 years in an attempt to find anything that would prove its past existence, but did not find anything. It is not me saying this. The Israeli historians and archaeologists said this. So he's saying that Israel has no connection with the Temple Mount, which is absurd. It's called the Temple Mount. It's where the Temple was. They said we could not find anything. We have nothing here. Erasing Jewish existence. So why lie? They dug underneath Al-Aqsa and above it. They dug everywhere, but did not find anything. They didn't, they didn't dig underneath Al-Aqsa. What is he talking about? The false Zionist and Israeli claims continue, says Mahmoud Abbas at the United Nations. They say that Israel made the desert blossom. They say that Palestine used to be a desert, and then they made it flourish. Uh, yes. Clearly, yes. This is true. They say they turned it into a heaven on earth. They cannot avoid lying, but what can we do? I mean, it's just anti-Semitic erasure of all Jews in the middle. They lie like, like Goebbels, he says. The Jews are like Nazis. Joe Biden fighting anti-Semitism, sending hundreds of millions of dollars to that guy. Thumbs up, Joe. Again, the left also likes to fight anti-Semitism by defending George Soros, who spends every waking moment attempting to undermine law and order in the United States. And also, by the way, to undermine the Jewish state. That dude is wildly anti-Israel. But Elon Musk, Elon Musk is the real anti-Semite. Again, according to the left, True anti-Semitism is apparently saying that George Soros is a bad person. Or apparently it's really bad that I said last week that Bernie Sanders is not Jewish. Okay, when I say he's not Jewish, I don't mean that he's technically not biologically or ethnically Jewish. I said on the show, he is ethnically Jewish, meaning his mom is Jewish. But Judaism is more than just your ethnic Judaism. Like if you have no connection to actual Jewish belief or practice, you're not particularly Jewish. Bernie Sanders is an anti-Israel fanatic who hates religion, generally speaking, and is a socialist who has fomented the worst members of his anti-Semitic party. I mean, it's, 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 it's wild. But, according, but Elon Musk is bad. Why is Elon Musk bad? Well, Elon Musk is the real answer. The left is focused, laser focused on anti-Semitism. Hundreds of millions of dollars to the Palestinian Authority, being nice to the Iranians, making sure that Rashida Tlaib has Nakba Day over in the Congress. No condemnation from the White House for any of that stuff. But Elon Musk, you know, he tweeted badly about George Soros. What did Musk tweet? He tweeted, Soros reminds me of Magneto. Why? Well, apparently he said, uh, so Brian Krasenstein said, fun fact, Magneto's experiences during the Holocaust as a survivor shaped his perspective as well as his depth and empathy. Soros, also a Holocaust survivor, gets attacked nonstop for his good intentions, which some Americans think are bad, merely because they disagree with his political affiliations. And Musk had the temerity to say, to say you, they, you assume they are good intentions. They are not. He wants to erode the very fabric of civilization. Soros hates humanity. 
Okay, now, you can think that's true about Soros. You can think it's not true about Soros. Uh, I certainly think that George Soros has taken inordinately terrible action in America's major cities and that his international agenda is really scurrilous. With that said, what does that have to do with Soros being ethnically Jewish? Soros himself holds no truck with Judaism. In any, like, again, the, the, the rule for the left is that they become very, very specific about ethnic Judaism only in order to defend Jews who really stand contra most of Judaism, Jewish philosophy, Jewish practice, the state of Israel. Then all of a sudden they become very, the word in Hebrew is makbid. They become, they become incredibly specific about what constitutes a Jew. Noam Chomsky, excellent Jew. Bernie Sanders, excellent Jew. George Soros, the only reason you would attack these people is because they are Jewish, not because they are wrong on everything. Now they are, they are wrong on everything and it's not anti-Semitic to say so. Ridiculous. By, by the way, they never seem to have the same sort of uh, qualms about criticizing, for example, Sheldon Adelstein, uh, Sheldon Adelson when he was alive. None of those qualms. Meanwhile, Elon Musk, it's sort of an astonishing exchange on CNBC that has now gone viral. He was asked about the fact that he says controversial things on Twitter, and here was his answer. You know, do your tweets hurt the company? Are there Tesla owners who say, I don't agree with his political position because, and I know it because he shares so much of it. Or there are advertisers on Twitter that Linda Yaccarino will come and say, you got to stop, man. Or, you know, I can't get these ads because of some of the things you tweet. <laughs> he really thinks about it for 12 seconds. He's thinking. You know, I'm reminded <laughs> of uh, the, the, the scene in The Princess Bride. Great movie. Great movie. Um, where he confronts the person who killed his father. And he says, Offer me money. Offer me power. I don't care. See, so you just don't care. You want to share what you have to say? I'll say what I want to say, and if, 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 uh, if the consequence of that is losing money, so be it. Okay. Good for him. Good for him. Okay, well, normally we do things I like and things I hate here, but today we have a bit of surprise here on the Ben Shapiro Show. Well, folks, here is the surprise. It's Brett Cooper from the comment section with Brett Cooper. And um, for those of you who say that we have never been in the same place at the same time, Either our green screening is fabulous or we are not the same person. <laughs> or it's AI. Or it's AI. Exactly. C could be AI. Yeah. So Brett is here to tell me about pop culture because I'm, you know, approaching 40 and I have three, almost four kids. And um, and so tell me about pop culture, Brett Cooper. I'm going to tell you all about pop culture. Thank I'm you. I'm going to give you a, a definition. No. Okay. So the thing I wanted to tell you about today, um, have you heard of sologamy? No. Okay, so you know, like polygamy. Yeah, I, I monogamy. I, okay, I can see the root of the word. I feel I know where you're going. So it's a new trend. Well, it's kind of been starting over the last few years. Like in 2019, Emma Watson said that she was self partnered. She was not single. She was self partnered, mm. and that is rooted in self care, and that she did not want to call herself single because that had like a negative connotation. You're self partnered. She's not a they them though. So she's like she's like a she her right. She's a she her. So yes. she can't. She's not multiple people. No, 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 okay. no, no, no. Got she's it. Just, All right. She's just being with herself. But now people are taking it so far that they are marrying themselves. Mm. Yes. So that's sologamy. Um, so I pulled some TikToks because they're not just saying, like, it's not just like, oh, I'm committing to myself and like, I'm going to work on myself. Whatever. No, they're having wedding ceremonies, which is what I wanted you to look at. I wanted to be a, a real life Ben Shapiro reaction. Okay. <laughs> A few weeks ago, I went to a self-love wedding. So my friend, Marcy, I love you, uh, married themselves for their birthday. Everyone ah, ah. As the opposite sex. Oh, no. Oh, no. Choose, so here are some of those well, outfits. I can understand why. And here's mine. The ceremony was so beautiful. Beautiful. There was even yep. a flower girl, and Marcy looked so beautiful. The whole ceremony What is? Oh, my God. There's an interpretive dance. I did shed a few tears. Oh, oh, no. So oh, no. Oh, no. No. Uh, that's a really cheap wedding cake for a self. For a, <laughs> for a self what, 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 what in the, well, I mean, I, okay. So, I understand. I yeah. understand, like, th these are not people who are going to find partners ever. So. <laughs> this is their last resort. This is basically the person who couldn't get a date at prom. They're like, well, I didn't even want to go to prom. Exactly. So, they're not going to get married because yep. who 
would do that mm-hmm. thing. So, so they're the, being proactive. And pro- they're like, they're no. getting ahead of it. They're getting yes. ahead of the story. Yeah. Getting ahead of the story. It's like when Barack Obama and his memoir was like, I did a little blow. It was like, he knew it was going to come out so during the, right? yeah. it's, it's already out there. So like these people are going to be single for life. So yeah. they're they're But now they're owning the singleness. Yes. It's empower. Life. It's empowering. Well, you know, it's the Woody, it's the old Woody Allen line that, you know, he masturbation is sex with the person he loves. So they're, 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 there you have it. Exactly. They're, they're marrying the one they love. They actually, this spiked during COVID because everybody was so lonely. And then coming out of COVID, all the women were apparently just drained because of the Zoom dates. And, you know, they just spent all this time inside and they didn't have boyfriends or anything like that. So apparently there were a ton of these weddings during COVID and there were all these psychologi- like psychologists that were covering this. We're like, this is like such a wild phenomenon. I have another one. Can you guys pull the one that's on? Oh yeah, here we go. This one's more elaborate. Okay. It's a little less more they, elaborate. Wow. It's a little less they them and a little more self love. Who's the child? I don't want to know. That's sad. The child's like, I'll never have a father now. <laughs> wow. Yep. This is uh. It's so elaborate. This is. How's the sound of the price going up? I, I do have a question. You mentioned that women were getting tired of Zoom dates. Yeah. Right. So I, I do have a question about that, which is why? That seems like the ideal female date because it's just all talking all the time. Yes, that's that's very <laughs> true. You just sit there and you're forced to talk. I don't, I think it's because whenever I go on a date with my wife, she's like, why aren't we talking more? So like I feel like a Zoom date is because normally on a date, like you just spend time with each other and you're like sitting there and the silence is OK. Activity. But, right. But on a Zoom yeah. date, like nothing's happening. So I feel like women would be like there's an inherent pressure to talk and Probably. share your feelings. So pro- so women were, were not cool with the Zoom date. I don't think they were. Interesting. I think okay, that's good. Think, that's good for society. I don't right. think that things progressed enough on Zoom dates. Ah, like to marriage? I don't know. Yeah. I, Maybe it was just like a symptom of the the traditional Zoom burnout because mm, it was just mm. online anyway. And okay. they were just like, you know, they weren't being held enough apparently. But this, that one that we just watched, the comments were actually positive. Not oh. about her. But people were calling her out on it, and she spent so much time debating these people. Like, the Bible says that in the last days, people would be uh, lovers of self. I didn't think it would go this far. And somebody (laughs) else said, my family would never. That was the thing. So many people showed up, and they're applauding this as if it's normal. What would you do if so? If somebody invited me to a wedding with them, like you can't even get me to go to a wedding with another person. If you're if you're if you're inviting me to a wedding with yourself, I just wouldn't go. Not only am I not sending a gift, yeah, I might send a drone attack like that's like, like like that's 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 horrifying yeah like, there's it, part of me that would want to go because it would it's so ridiculous it's great for your show like you bring a camera and that's like amazing for your I show i need those little snapchat uh sun, sunglasses if you've seen those that have cameras in them, uh, you so need I like the james o'keefe there. team there exactly with, like, yeah i wanted to do a video with him so that he could teach me how to be undercover so i could go do things like this because i think it would be really good content but i don't think i could go in all seriousness it would it would be for content well, yeah. I mean, how could you go in serious? <laughs> well, no. I would just be laughing the whole time. I do know people that probably would do this. Somebody else said, no words. If this was my friend, I'd be recommending therapy and certainly not showing up for this foolishness. Because it's enabling, number one, narcissism. But it's just, it's so unhealthy. And it's mostly women. I mean, that first one was even more sad because that was like a 20-year-old girl. It's like, if you've lost all hope at my age, it's, like you need to change your behavior. Why, why are birth rates dropping in the United States? Why? I, it's a mystery. No so one knows. Hard, because women are no marrying themselves. Mm. Okay, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about. Um, By the way, if, if they then have sex with somebody else or marry somebody else, are they cheating on themselves? Probably. Is it, it's polyamorous well, it's it's now not or a, what? It's not illegal, obviously, because you can't marry yourself. And so they all, they often. Not for long. I no, mean, I'm sure it, that they it, will. They will yeah. In Massachusetts, that. very soon. <laughs> There's, in the article, in the articles that are about, you know, this self-marriage and all that stuff, they all say, well, of course, you can't have tax breaks yet. It's not legal yet. Yes, yes. We wish that you could. <laughs> and of course, it doesn't mean that they can't date other people. It's like, well, if you're going to marry yourself, go full out. Yeah, I, I like, agree. Then, then just be celibate. <laughs> like, actually commit to exactly, it. Exactly, like full priest nun. They can't like, even commit like, to themselves. Right, that's, yeah, lack of commitment. Yep. All right, the last thing on pop culture I wanted to talk to you about, Kardashians. Mm. They are all dating a certain kind of man right now. Okay. <laughs> and I think that it's some kind of like Chris Jenner manipulation because Kylie Jenner is now dating Timothy Chalamet. Mm-hmm. Do you know who he is? I, I do know who Timothy Chalamet he, is. He looks like I could break him in half. He's yeah, like he a does. little toothpick. Yeah. That's true. And then uh, Courtney married, oh my God, why am I blanking out on his name? Is it Travis? Travis Barker. She married Travis Barker. Both of them, it's like they've moved on from the black NBA players and now they're dating who I call the wet cigarette men. Mm. 
They have no te- they have no testosterone whatsoever. They are this big. They are all smaller than all of the Kardashian women. Mathematically, I don't know how that works at all. Mm. And Kim was dating Pete Davidson. It's the same right. genre of man. Well, the, the the shift from Kanye to Pete Davidson, that's a radical shift. It was. I mean, I have to say, that's like, I can't think of a much more radical shift than yeah. Kanye to Pete Davidson. That's, that, that is, first of all, I don't understand the Pete Davidson phenomenon yeah. at all. It makes nope. no sense to me. I, 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 Girls I, like him because he's sweet and he's funny and he's not a, a toxic masculine man. Toxic. I mean, he doesn't seem super masculine no, generally. He, he so just that, that is one way to get rid of toxic masculinity is to not date masculine men. Exactly. They will just become passport bros. Oh, have you yeah. heard passport bros? What is a passport bro? Okay, passport bros are men that are so fed up with Western women because we're all apparently so woke and so terrible and Western women don't want to be wives that they are now going to other countries to find wives. That's like which countries? Like uh, Southeast Asia, they're going to the you know the Philippines, the Dominican Republic. So it's like they're... the opposite of the mail order bride. Yes, so like, exactly. Okay, so they're, yes. instead of ordering out, instead of using stamps.com. Yes, <laughs> and bringing them here, right, they're, they're like they're we want to get out. Yeah, and then all it feels the... more expensive, but okay. it is. Yeah, well, actually, I mean, you can go to these countries and they're usually cheaper. And so a lot of these mm-hmm. men get remote jobs, and so they go there and they live in these countries, and then they meet these women. And then women in the Western world, specifically the United States, are so pissed off about it. And they're like, you're going to all these countries where these women don't even know how to speak English. They can't even read. They're so uneducated. And then the men, like, film themselves with these women and, like, show themselves on dates. And the women are so elegant and they're so well-spoken and they're so traditional. And they're like, look at these women. Like, they're so respectful and kind. And the Western women are, you know, sitting on their, you know, fresh and fit podcasts or whatever podcasts, losing their mind over this. But yeah, passport bros. Because okay. Because Western women are so bad. Hmm. Did not know about that. Yeah. I mean, That's why I'm here. Mm, interesting. I mean, I, I, I did marry a, a woman from abroad. I mean, she's she been in America since she was 12, but uh-huh. still, she's Israeli. So. There you go. Yeah. You're like a reverse passport, bro. Yeah, exactly. Well, she came here and she got citizenship, so kind of. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't import her. I did, I did not import my, my wife, no. <laughs> Make that very clear. <laughs> the rest of the show continues right now, believe it or not. We are going to go from this to me talking about the Catholic view of lust with Matt Frad host of Pints of Aquinas. He'll be joining us momentarily. This is a wild show today. If you're not a member, become a member. Use code Shapiro at checkout for two months free with our annual plan.